My guest this week has certainly changed the world and has helped shape an awful lot of the debate that is going on at the moment around Me Too. Rose McGowan is one of the women who brought down Harvey Weinstein, revealing shocking allegations that prompted a whole load of other people to then come forward with what they said had happened to them. And she's been a, a very clear and striking voice throughout the unfolding of, of this whole Me Too phenomenon. She's also written an astonishingly open and candid book about her own life called Brave, which tells the story from childhood right up to the modern day. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much. You say right at the beginning that the book is a public service and that you do want to help other people. What do you mean by that? I mean that it's it is a form of public service in the sense that I've been raised to do volunteer work. My family was very big on volunteering. My father did AIDS hospice. Um, and we have always given back. And I think people should kind of give back to the highest level of their ability. And I just have kind of a strange ability to do so in the sense that I have media access and a loud voice. And it's just my form of donating time in a way and, and thought because the book is really, it's an autobiography, but it's also a think piece and a motivational piece. And you want other people to learn from it? I definitely do. Who, who do you think can learn most from it, men or women? I think both. That's a very good question. I, you know, I get asked a lot about feminism and, and I... I say I'm a feminist because I'm not stupid, um, because I believe in equal pay and equal rights, and to me that's all it is. But I'm a humanist, above all. I don't believe in, I think gender is a cult-like way of thinking. I think societal indoctrination leads to cult-like ways of thinking, and I think it's about being human and seeing each other as human that will stop abuse of power and that will lead us to treating each other better. I mean, you talk about cults in the book, not least because you, you sort of grew up in one. Yes. The, the children of God, and you escaped that. And then you, I mean, do you believe that all sort of conventional ways of living are essentially cults? Yes, <laughs> I do, actually. I, I, I don't want to sound weird and say I see them everywhere, like I see dead people, but it's, it's the structure of it. You know, America with its nationalism, don't leave, we're number one, don't travel, you don't need to. Why would you go anywhere else? We're the best. There are many levels of cult-like thinking. And I think it's the same thing, again, with gender. It's the same thing with power structures. Anytime you're supporting a power structure that doesn't support you back, you're, you're likely in a cult. And a lot of people will assume that um, 2017 was the moment you first came forward with your story about Harvey Weinstein. That's not true, is it? It was 20 I mean, years before. Yeah, well, t tell us, you know, when you first spoke about what happened. I first spoke about what happened the same day that it happened to me, and that was 20 years ago, a little over that now. And I... It was not that I swore vengeance, but I knew one day there would be a reckoning. I didn't think it would take that long or be that hard, but why it was. Why do you think it did? I mean, why did it take 20 years for people to suddenly listen to what you'd been saying? I'll be really honest. I think in a way Trump helped a lot. I know that sounds strange, but his very black and white um, forms of sexism and racism, like it's kind of like people were, oh, that's what sexism is. That's what people have been complaining about all these years. Oh, that's what racism is. This is what they've been complaining about all these years. It was, it needed to be illustrated and it was kind of during the campaign and I was in the second year of writing my book when he was campaigning. It took me three years to write and it was so egregious, his behavior, but it really seemed to wake a lot of people on the left up that thought like, oh, this is all just people complaining about stuff into the air. And, and they really saw it in a black and white way and they realized I could utilize this social shift, this paradigm shift, this awakening to what that was, um, to mine and others' benefits. I mean, you, say, you say you spoke about what happened in that hotel suite with Weinstein pretty much immediately after coming out. Yes. Partly because there was a TV crew filming you when you came out as well, wasn't it? Isn't that sick? Which is just astonishing. I mean... Yeah. Um, you said, because of the book, the book, is a, the book is a really interesting read because you name a lot of people and, and what they said and what they did, you know, innocent and, uh, and not so innocent along the way. 
Um, you talk in that instance about coming out and doing a tell, telling your co-star in the movie that you were promoting at the time, but you didn't you didn't name who it was. Was that is there a reason for that? It came it was, out it was later. The movie Phantom, wasn't it? It was. It was Ben Affleck, and he you know might not remember it for all I know, but I remember it certainly because I was shocked. So you told Ben Affleck within hours. I actually didn't happened. tell him exactly what happened. I had a stricken face and I was shaking and I said, I've just come from uh, so-and-so's hotel. And you, people understand, they think of hotel rooms kind of how we normally do. You open a door and there's a bed. A presidential suite is the entire top floor of a hotel, likely with three living rooms and offices. It's not the kind of hotel rooms that most people think of. It's not like you're walking in, there's a bed. And it was extremely normal to have meetings in hotels. This is how everybody in the industry really travels a lot, and that's how it was always done. But you say that he said to you, oh, I told him to stop doing God that. God damn it, I told him to stop doing that. What do you think he meant by that? I think he meant stop, hopefully he meant stop hurting women. Not not stop inviting women up to your hotel suite. You think he, he, he knew what he was talking about then? You know, it's such a different time and a way of not... There's such an attitude towards actresses of you wore a short skirt, you deserved it. Your face is that short skirt, right? And, and I'm sure he also, you know, the bad guys, I'll call him, also slept with people that wanted to sleep with him for parts or for whatever reason. But what he really liked was abuse of power. And I, I think I can't get into Ben Affleck's head and say he 100% knew that it was an egregious thing like rape. But to see me afterwards and see me that shaken up and to say what he said, I can only surmise that there is some knowledge, yes. You, you then describe, you know, how you, you secured a, an agreement um, in which Weinstein had to pay you. Um, and, and then, and, you know, and sort of moved on with your life, but in, in which he then tried to freeze you out and oh, he did. blacklisted he, he you did. And, and, and all those sorts of things. So were, were you telling people generally about what, what had happened to you and what was going on, or did you essentially shut up about it? I didn't shut up. I never signed a non-disclosure. I asked for money so I could go to therapy and donate. In my young mind, I thought $100,000 was a lot of money. And I needed money to go to therapy, and I donated some to a rape crisis network. And that's what I did with that money. But I refused to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I had said, if I ever hear of you doing this to another person, I will come out against you. And it took me 20 years, but I did exactly what I said. I'm still trying to get my head around why it took so long. Because um, the people there are in a cult, because the people there protect, because of power, because of money, because the women set it up. Because it's, it's, and, and our, you know, because people behave, you know, I hate to give you bad news from the home front, but Hollywood is not exactly known for sterling character. And it's something that's extremely hands off. It's not like, you know, in my industry, there was a human resources department with a sexual harassment department. And because it was so part and parcel of how it was supposed to be, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's just how Harvey is. That's just how he is without realizing the human cost and the human, you know, it's a form of theft. It's, it's really the highest form of theft aside from murder. So when it did kick off in 2017, mm -hmm. and, you know, it literally went all around the world. I set up those articles. What do you mean? What do I mean is that I'm the one who contacted the New York Times and I'm the one who got them involved because for a year before the articles came out, um, he was trying to stop the publication of my book behind the scenes and harassing me. And I knew it was time to call in the big guns. And so I got a hold of the New York Times. And originally it was NBC that was also doing the story. So I contacted Ronan Farrow and went in between both of them and kind of pitted them against each other because I knew one of them would fall and it was NBC that fell. And I knew they would. But I needed the New York Times to break it first. And then luckily took his, Ronan took his story to the New Yorker. Did you have a sense of where it was going? Yes. That it, was, it would be that groundbreaking and earth-shattering? I knew it would be earth-shattering. I went to Hawaii the first weekend the, the articles came out because it was literally like 
an electrical storm in my body, the amount of people talking about it and, and your phone, it almost feels like, you know, whenever you go viral or certainly globally, and it was for months and months and months, it feels like this live wire, this eel that's attached to your hand of voices all across the world. And it's an intense feeling and it's a really intense thing to go through. And hard to relate to, I imagine. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of unimaginable. It's not just hard to relate to, really. It's so psychologically, I, I don't, like, horrifying. I don't really even have the right descriptive words for what it was like. It kind of felt like my skin was being pulled off with hot needles. I mean, you know, we, we call this podcast Ways to Change the World because it's literally about people talking about how to make the world a better place. So, And, and rarely does it seem to fit so easily with, with, with a guest as it does with you in that you clearly thought this is going to change the world. Yes. And that's I, why you were doing it. That's why I was doing it. It was not about me too. That actually came a couple weeks later. That hashtag started a couple weeks after the stories broke. And it was really, for me, I was sitting around one night at my house and I was thinking about being a better human. And I was wondering if I could be better and by what percentage. And I kind of came up with this arbitrary number, 10%. I kind of sat around thinking, I bet I could be a 10% better human. I wonder if other people could be too. I wonder if I can try to help other people be smarter and see things in a more clear way. Uh, smarter in a way, socially, in a social consciousness way. I wonder if I can make them aware of things that shouldn't stand in our culture, in our society, that we shouldn't have to put up with, that things can, in fact, be different, that we can have a more nuanced and adult conversation about things than have previously ever been had, you know, about specific subjects but for me my overall goal wasn't I'm not an activist that goes after like a single issue I was more kind of addressing an overall social evolution and I wanted to see if I could push people to be 10 percent better and 10 percent more awake and that was my goal I mean when you step back from everything that's happened because it's, it's been a while now so I, I guess you've got some perspective on it what do you think has actually been revealed I think there's been an incredible amount that's been revealed. I, I have people that come up to me in the street saying their daily life has changed. I have, I've heard from people within, you know, Hollywood that say things have changed, that they're in the writer's room and it's the first time they're ever being listened to as a woman. But also a lot of men thank me. And it's not that I do this for approbation or thanks. It's, it's actually nice to be recognized, certainly. And I think... I am more of a man of the people, if you will, than a media darling. The media came at me really hard, you know, and I had to do a major fight to do this. And, and it was one of those things where I was waiting for so long for somebody else to do it. I wanted somebody else to come along. And finally, I, I just figured, if not me, then whom? If not now, then when? It's time. Were you braced for the attacks? I mean, did you, did you think that was going to happen? Because you know, people attacked you as, oh, well, she took the money and she did this right, and, she, you know, and she was an actress and what did she expect and why did she shut up for so long and all these questions. Right, which I didn't. It was just exactly. never... People it, just didn't I realize. Never, people just didn't realize it. <laughs> and even if I had, that would be my purview and my right as a victim. You know, sometimes it takes a very long time to be able to heal enough that you can fight these fights or be open without, with this stuff. One of the things that I tell people and one of the things I always knew was that it wasn't my shame. This is not my shame. I was not, I was expecting media attacks, but not at the level that it was the vitriol and the kind of, the fact that there was such disparity between how people on the streets treated me and what they understood, and then the kind of moronic nature oftentimes of the media, there was a huge schism and a lot of them had no decency. But I didn't care about them because I knew the message had to be out there. I knew I had to thump it. I knew I had to work hard at it. And I knew I had to push the world, whether they wanted to or not. It's for their own good. A lot of people in society really fight at change happening. But I always say, like, you know, when you were little and you got taller, your legs hurt for a period, right? But guess what? You got taller. And that's the same thing with any kind of growth and change. It does hurt. It is painful. It was ugly. It was like the year of the trigger that whole year, you know? Um, almost a year and a half. And it was hard for a lot of people in the world, men and women, boys and girls, everybody that's been hurt, you know? And, and I respect that and I felt bad for that, but it had to happen for a thunderous change to happen. And, and do you think there's any danger that that change will just slip back and slip off the agenda that, you know, that we'll, we'll say, well, we've had Me Too, we've done that, we've dealt with it. 
I, I see Me Too is, is to me, it seems to have been sold as this movement by the media, which made me think of like, oh, are there thousands of women with pitchforks in the street? And that's not the case. Yeah. That was not that. It's not that at all. It's really a social reset. Me Too simply happened with, did this happen to you? Me Too. That's really it. But the media ran with the Me Too movement. And it, it wasn't that. It was that people were feeling strong enough to speak out, but also... It was just like pressing a reset button on social consciousness. And and I to me that's what it's about. It's it's not women with pitchforks running after men. So you don't you don't see it as a sort of continual process, a continual fight that you have to keep fighting. Well, I think people once you get smarter, you can't kind of get dumb again. I think you have to go forward and I think it's incumbent upon ourselves to keep pushing at thought and to keep, you know, one of the things I like to say to do is to write down your belief system and look at what are yours and what have been implanted by society. Take what you want and leave the rest. Same thing with fears, same thing with all of these kind of things that we get implanted in us and we carry around without realizing and we behave a certain way. So when people start breaking the hows and whys of their thoughts down and their belief systems, they comes a lot of clarity and often a roadmap for how to live. And I think if people will do that, even reviewing how they feel about, you know, this kind of topic, it will continue to lead to social change. I, I think once the genie's out of the, you know, out of the lamp, you can't stuff it back in. Can we, let's wind back a bit. Yeah. I mean, how, how much do you think, um, you know, breaking out of the Hollywood nightmare that you were in had to do with the fact that you'd all already broken out of another nightmare in childhood, which was this bizarre way you were being brought up in a cult. I think it had a lot to do with it. There's something, I don't know the exact number, but it's in the 70, 80 percentile of people that escape cults get found, uh, found themselves in, to, in other cults. There's a high, it's like a recidivism rate almost. And it took me a long time to figure out that Hollywood was a cult and operated in a, in a lot of ways identically to the one I grew up in. Well, tell me about your childhood then. I mean, what was Children of God like? Children of God was both horrifying and fascinating and stressful, very stressful. I was born into uh, the sect that was in Italy and my father ran the Italian chapter there was a duke that was in the group, so we grew up on his uh, estate. So I was in Tuscany, which had the most amazing food and, and beauty, but with a lot of psychological ugliness. And when they started advocating child adult sex is when we escaped and came to America. But that's when... America was almost more horrific for me than the cult. The cult did a lot of lasting damage in the sense that I thought I had really blocked out a lot of the um, teachings just because they didn't make any sense to me. And I thought, frankly, they were stupid. And So you never bought into it? Never. I was born into it, but I didn't buy into it. Quite hard to resist that, though, isn't it? When you're literally born into something and indoctrinated and threatened with violence and all that stuff going on around you, and it's your father who wants you to be part of this? Yes. And your mother? Yes. It was. It was a fight. I fought every day. And I was just, I mean, a kind of strange child that I do wonder what life would have been like if I would just been allowed to lay in a field and have time to imagine things or do art or... I don't know what children do. I don't know what they're like. I've never been one. So you didn't go to school or anything like that as a child? We were homeschooled. I learned how to read at two and a half. Uh, and I was reading pretty intense books by four and five. And then when I came to America later, I was shocked by their level of schooling, which is you're this old, so you're allowed to read this. And I, I took great umbrage at their influencing what I could read or not read. And, and uh, I was kind of really dismayed by... I'm not going to lie how dumb a lot of it was in America and how, how rotten the school system was and how much it reminded me of the cult I grew up in, except for with less high-level intelligence because the cult attracted, it was multinational, and it attracted people that wanted a new utopia 
but also were really quite smart and intelligent and learned people. What was the basic idea? What were you supposed to be buying into? Well, that's what I never could understand. I couldn't figure out what the main tenant was. It seemed to change on the daily depending on what they wanted you to do. It would, it was always changing. It was an end of days cult. So. But it was, it was sexualized and patriarchal. Very much so, extremely patriarchal. You know, I say my father who was a pretty amazing human, but his great failing was male ego and that he needed to be worshiped. And he called himself God with a small G. <laughs> That's some chutzpah. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you came to America, um, I mean, you ended up emancipating yourself. Yes. How did you even know that was a thing? I don't really know how I know that was a thing. I think I'd seen a movie about someone divorcing their parents and it gave me the idea to do the same. I could do that. I represented yeah. myself in court and I tell this story in my book and and I wore um, ladies nylons thinking that's what adult women lawyers would wear because I was representing myself. And uh, I I got divorced from my parents. It seemed the right thing to do. I was 15 and I'd already had quite enough. And what reasoning did you have to give? Uh, hardship. And I'd also been homeless at 13. I was a runaway. And then I went back for a year with my father for a year when I was 14. And then at 15, ultimately, I just was done. And, and I was living in, I moved down to Los Angeles by myself at that point. And I just needed access to having my own bank account, being able to get a car, you know, doing things that required normally a parental signature, but I didn't have any access to that sort of thing. Did you have any happiness in your childhood? I have, I think, a real eye for beauty, and I could see beauty everywhere and often. Did I have happiness? I had some bursts, but my family was very funny. My brothers and sisters are hilarious. And we would, it was like gallows humor, but we would definitely make each other laugh, absolutely. And they were very smart. They're some of the brightest people I've ever met. So it was also like kind of, I didn't bother making friends because there were so many of us. Because I mean, the, the, the way, I mean, obviously, the, you know, you miss huge chunks out because it's a, it's a short book. Um, but I mean, it, it, it does read horrifically. You know, you kind of think, my God, this must have been absolutely awful. Um, but it you also talk times. about how, <laughs> but you also talk about how you don't really want people to have offered you their sympathy or their sorrow or you know sort of about that. I've met so many people with extreme lives, maybe not quite as extreme as mine, but you know everyone has a story, and I get a lot of people that do say, "I'm so sorry for how you grew up," and I just say, "I'm so sorry for how you lived," because I got free. What's your excuse? You know? Tell us about getting free, because that's the point. I mean, that, and that's that what you point. want other people to learn, isn't it? Yes. So at what point is, is, you know, is, is emancipation the beginning of you saying, I'm going to be free? Or, you know, no, what, I think what, I what point was. did you start sort of this journey of being free? Honestly, as, as being really young and fighting against indoctrination, that's when I started the journey. I didn't understand why... I wasn't allowed to be myself. I didn't understand why people were always coming at me. There's something about me, and I write this in the book, I, I used to make a lot of adults uncomfortable, and I know I can, I'm, for whatever reason, a polarizing figure. I think I'm a fairly amiable sort. <laughs> but then I would, wouldn't I? Now, uh, I think I've always been a freedom fighter. You know, the person I relate most to in history is, and I'm not saying, you know, he, he casts a very long shadow, but I, I very much uh, like Malcolm X. And I, and I read his autobiography that Alex Haley wrote um, when I was 11. And it had great impact on me. And I thought, anger can move mountains. And it doesn't mean that one enjoys being angry, because who does? It's, it's not a fun way to have to be. Nobody wants to be, but sometimes it helps push things forward. I, I do wonder what the world would be like if he had lived. I think it'd be significantly different. What else do you admire about Malcolm X? There's a lot more to him than anger, isn't there? Oh, far more. He gets really, he's been so, it's, but that's how he's presented to the world, angry black man, don't you know? There's far more to him. He's a very complex human. And he came from nothing and made something of himself. You know, he came from nothing. I came from nothing. Is that what you've been doing? 
coming from nothing and making something of yourself? No, I don't think so. When I say making something of myself, I don't mean in the financial way. And maybe that's not what you mean either. I mean more in a furtherance of self, I suppose. And making something of myself, something that counts as an individual. I believe in individualism greatly. And I believe in the power of individuality. And I believe in the power of trying to fight for your place in history. It sounds like you must have seen what was going on in Hollywood and the film and TV industry oh, very early it. on. Yeah. So, so why did you stick with it? Well, once you get famous, what other kind of job are you going to get? Where are you going to go? And I got famous very quickly. I was discovered um, on the streets in Hollywood. And two weeks later, I was starring in a movie. And then it won Sundance. And then I was on the cover of all these magazines. And then it just went from there. And what other job are you going to get at that point? You know, it's, it's, it's a double bind. Just tell us how you were discovered. Is it really like that quick? It didn't happen. It's, I, to my knowledge, it, it's, it was that quick, you know. But um, my boyfriend had been murdered. And I was standing on a street corner crying. And this woman came up to me while I was crying and said, do you want to be an actress? <laughs> Which is so Hollywood. And I looked at her and I just said, God, no. And then she knew the person I was standing next to and she kept kind of coming at him to get a hold of me. And finally, I had nowhere to live. Once again, I was about to find myself homeless. So I did the first movie I did to prevent homelessness. And it was a starring role in a Greg Araki movie, which he's a very famous uh, indie cult director and did a lot of seminal movies, queer movies. And this was his first named heterosexual movie. And um, it was a hard set, you know, and I knew right away, I was like, oh, men are prized above all here, this sucks. But I was also working through a lot of pain because of my boyfriend dying and just trying to survive. But in the movie, it was funny, the male characters are kind of supposed to have their thumbs over this girl's head. And I thought, not on my watch. So I kind of subverted the whole thing just through acting. And, and really, it was a big breakout role. Um I'm talking to you is quite funny because sort of every 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 clause sort of bears bears a little bit of further um, examination. And you began <laughs> that sentence with my boyfriend had just been murdered, so you'd better just tell us about that first. Oh well, okay, uh, yeah, that was um, that was that was. There's no words for it. It's so horrific. Someone broke into um, our apartment while I was out of town and uh, stabbed him 23 times and almost decapitated him. And it was an employee of his. And um, he was a bit older than me. Uh, and he was lovely. He was like the Pied Piper of good spirits. Everybody loved him. And, and uh, it really, you know, again, it's, that one is the highest form of theft. I often think about the fear and the pain that he was in as he died. And it, it, uh, it breaks my heart. Yeah, he should be here. And how old were you? I was 19. That's a hell of a lot to deal with at 19, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you say you stuck with this um, for, because you didn't really feel you had anything else that you could do at that stage. I always call them useless talents. I have these other talents, but I didn't know how to make any money off of them. And so this was the one thing. And I had, you know, when you're homeless and you're hungry and you're cold, you very often, if you get out of homelessness, have this rock bottom fear of going back there again. And that terror kept me in Hollywood. I, 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 and I also it had been so long. And also there's a point where you spend so much more of your life being different people that are not you, wearing clothes that you wouldn't want to wear, eating food you wouldn't want to eat, being around people that wouldn't necessarily be your choice of people to be around and you are impersonating other people for 12 to 17 hours a day for months on end, sometimes years on end. And you only get to be you and your time off when you go home and go to sleep and you pass out because you're tired and you come back and you start all over again. So I missed a lot of my own life and didn't have, maybe if I had more time just to space out and think, I could have separated myself more. But as it was, it was just kind of like a work machine. You explain that very well. I mean, it, it makes me... Would you mind explaining to me? Because I, I think one, one of the reasons I suspect people have attacked people like you 
uh, who have come forward and spoken about what happened to them is because they don't understand either uh, this notion of being petrified in a situation. You freeze. The freeze. Could you explain the freeze? Because because you you talked about how in 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 that moment when you were in Harvey Weinstein's suite, he pushed you into this room with the jacuzzi, and uh, you know, terrible things happened, and you froze. So j just explain what that is. You know, they've re recently added fight, flight, or freeze to that saying, um, to the, the, I guess, the psychological diagnosis of what happens when you're under trauma. And people who have been traumatized um, before, it can re-traumatize them. And freezing is very, very common. I think it might be more common than the other two. And a lot of people, you turn into the statue. And it's crazy. I had this Uber driver write about a couple of weeks after the stories broke in the New York Times. And he was, he didn't know it was me. I was sitting behind him. And I use a fake name on Uber. And he started going on about how he didn't know why these girls just couldn't get out of the hotel room. And I'm sitting in the back of his car thinking, oh, my God. And I started explaining. I said, haven't you ever been so scared that you couldn't move? Haven't you ever been so shocked? that you couldn't move. And he said, yes, when I was nine years old, I got so scared my feet wouldn't work. And I said, that's it exactly. And he understood. And that's what it is. I snapped out of my body and floated up to the ceiling and watched everything from up above, but my body was a statue. It couldn't move. I was so shocked, I guess, my body and my mind, you split off from yourself to save yourself. It's also a form of self-protection. So when people say, well, why didn't you run? It, well, first of all, you have someone who's about six foot four and 350 pounds up against you. But also it's, you know, and I pray it never happens to people. But if it does, you two might freeze like a statue. How, how do you, I mean, he, he point blank denies your allegations against him. He says mm -hmm. it was, you know, he says the idea that there wasn't consensual Which, sexual activity that word repulses is, is rubbish. Um, and, and that this the word is all... consensual repulses me on a great, on a, on a, when it comes to him, it's something that's been a huge trigger for me these past year and a half. It's so vile and so not the case and so not the truth. And everybody around him knows that too. So how important is it that there is a conviction? I mean, honestly, I'd prefer if he just fall off the planet, it would make life much easier. Um, that would be more important to me than a conviction and, and more satisfying if someone like him just ceased to exist, someone who's brought untold pain to so many. Um, a conviction, I have, I'm cautiously optimistic, very cautiously, because rich people buy off justice all the time. And this is a man who had, you know, ex Mossad working for him. So who knows? Maybe they can get to jurors. Maybe they can get to... Lawyer, I mean, it's disgusting, and my former lawyer is now representing him. It's, it's, it's just, it's a travesty, and if, if he gets off, it will be a travesty as well. But I'm, I've heard you say in the past, you know, that it, 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 it wasn't important to you that your particular case couldn't be prosecuted no. because it's so long ago. That you know, one case is all of you. It is. is that, it really? I mean, it really is. I never had a vendetta against him for myself. I had one against him for what he did to others. For some reason, I can feel it more deeply, what he did to others. I feel it very deeply for myself. I was, you know, I had nightmares for years, still occasionally get them, woke up sweating in bed with my hair all wet and, you know, having to change the sheets, screaming out at night. This man has been the thing of nightmares for too many. And it needed to stop. Where do you think the conversation about patriarchy and feminism goes next, though? Because what happened with that whole year of Me Too was that everybody in their different walks of life said what well, said Me Too, you know, um, and not just women, you know, men no, as well. Exactly. Um, and and as you say, there have, there have there have been individual changes, employment attitudes, and writers' rooms, and who's in charge, and trying to promote more women and all the rest of it. But where do you think the actual conversation goes uh, for more fundamental change? Because at the moment, it's sort of it feels very incremental, doesn't it? Not really. You think it's bigger than that? I think it's much bigger than that. I've been all over the world and, uh, you know, in the past year and a half, traveled a lot, um, gone to different places to give speeches, things like that. And, you know, 
it's a girl in India in the middle of my speech standing up with tears in her eyes saying me too in a room full of billionaires and fat cats and politicians. And it's more than it's, you know, and the individual is people power. And the way the patriarchy, I mean, it just needs to go. It's so boring already. You say there are many older women who are as sexist or more sexist than men. And I'm sure younger women too. But then just I've... getting rid of the patriarchy in, in simple terms of sort of men being well, in charge. the child. patriarchy isn't only men. Okay. Well, Toxic explain. masculinity isn't just the purview of males. Toxic masculinity affects males and females alike. And, you know, trans people, everybody else under the sun. It's the paradigm is what needs to be smashed and subverted. You know, it's, it's, it's not the purview of males that they're toxic. It's that it bleeds over. And it hurts them just as much. I mean, I, when I got the GQ Man of the Year Award a few months ago, I was really, you know, in my speech, I said a lot of people ask me if what I do is for women. And, and honestly, in the abstract, it's for men. Because I see the box they get put into when they're children. I see what they're told, how they're, how they're indoctrinated into masculinity, how it's implanted in them. And I think it steals them from such a young age and traps them in this, in this box that just should never be around them. They should be free humans too. Free to be the human they're meant to be and not free to be the one that society tells them they're be, supposed to be just because they're men. It breaks my heart. But men have reacted, some men have reacted as well to what's been going on. I mean, at the end of your book, you, well, know, you, you, you talk about, you know, you, you say men really need to have a big think, you know, about who you are and all the violence do. and terrible things that stem from the fact that you are... Well, Who where is it coming from and why is it coming? You know, where, what's, what's, what's nature versus your nurturing? And nurture doesn't have to be a positive thing, you know? And, and how do we stop this way of thinking in order to be better humans? In so how much do you think is nature? I think uh, a lot of it is the nurture. I think a lot of it is the nurture. I think when there's a predator out there, that's a totally different ball game. You know, I recently had a conversation with a male friend of mine who sat around. He said he had a great conversation with five of his guy friends. They sat around all night talking about times they'd gone too far or times they were the best, you know, kind of human they could be. And, and just dissecting it, you know, that's what needs to happen. Just have honest conversation. Because once you talk about it and once you think about it, you can't unthink. And I think that's where we go forward. And I see men getting better and better as humans. I do. I really, really do. And I see them wanting to be better. And I see women needing to be better and needing to realize that not only is the king chair that men are placed in an illusion, you know, the queen chair is just as worthy. And they both don't have to be an illusion. We can earn these things. It's okay to sit in the king chair if you earn it, but make sure you do. And I think the way to earn it is by being a positive and really good force for change out there in the world. Do what you can, do it. Stand up for yourself, stand up for your neighbor. Be better. So let's say we put you in charge of changing the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can do whatever you want to do. What's on your list? Potentially politics. But what's on my list? I really just want people to look, if your life is a piece of fabric, you know, and it's a tapestry, look at the threads that are organically yours, your thought threads and your beliefs and your fears. What are organic and what are implanted synthetics? And take the synthetic ones out. It's really just examining your own life. But isn't all knowledge synthetic in your terms? You know, it's implanted in us. And some mm -hmm. of it is good. No, I think, I mean, I feel like I had belief systems in me that came from myself growing up. You know, very much so. Maybe it is, you know, that's the whole thing. I think because the cult I grew up in was so intense, I could see it for what it was. Whereas I think most people that are in a more watered down version of a cult can't see it for what it is. I think I would get them to see that clearly and get them to see that they are much freer than they even can dream of being. And they can do it. What's the biggest hurdle to that? People don't really like change that much. They fight against it. <laughs> You know, you can be a Boy Scout all you want. People would be like, no, or a Girl Scout, and they say, I don't want your cookies. And you're like, but these cookies are good. The cookie is thought, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know. I have, against all odds, a lot of hope for humanity. I believe in us. So is politics a, a thing you're thinking of? It is. In what form? 
I haven't really fully hashed that out yet. It's just something that's recently been running through my brain. And I might go back to school and do a politics and a, a political science and journalism double major. Um, but, but with a view to running for office in some yes. form? I'd have to figure out which office. Maybe the Senate, maybe the presidency. It might surprise you to know I wouldn't run as a Democrat. What would you run as? Probably a Republican. Not because I agree with their ideology. I agree with the original Republican platform, you know, hundreds of years ago, I, I do agree with. But not now, not, not for a long time. But I, I would rather infiltrate the side that's against me versus, you know, the echo chamber. I think you can get a lot more done. Do you agree with the economics of the Republican Party or the worldview? Or, I mean, like, is there anything you agree with about mm -hmm. the Republican Party or you just think, that's the one I need to change, so that's the one I'll join? <laughs> <laughs> I like a hard fight. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think, what is the hardest road I can possibly take? Let me take that one. <laughs> yes. Possibly so. Um, I agree with the original thing of, like, less government in your life and, and uh, less taxes. Sure, that sounds great. Unfortunately, that's not exactly how it ended up not by any stretch. Uh, I think we need to really separate um, religion from, from government. I think that's really, really mandatory. And I think a lot of our problems certainly stem from religion. And in sort of social and welfare, I mean, you know, if, if, you're, if you're gonna look at the Republicans and the Democrats, oh, I don't are you, think are you I... saying you sort of side with a small government, you know, L I think I mean more in, in, in national debt worldview. and things like that, you know, um, but I wouldn't say I'm a bleeding heart liberal, but I would definitely say that I have deep empathy and care for people. But I think things can be restructured to work a lot better. The mental health system or lack thereof in the United States is appalling. It's, it's disgusting that no Democrats have, you know, gone for that. What we have school shootings like every day there and no and they're always saying, you know, it's mental health problems that cause people to shoot each other. Okay, well then why don't you have any mental health facilities or mental health care then? Nobody's doing anything. So we just keep, if no one's taking away the guns, why aren't you advocating for mental health care? I don't see any Democrats doing that. And do you think America's ready to vote for somebody like you? Sure, why not? Maybe in five years, four years. It's not a long time. I mean, if you think where we are now. It's not a long time. With, with, with the kinds of candidates who gain traction in America. Yeah. You're a long way away from that. Ah, uh, you'd be surprised. I think I have a lot more ground support than people know. What's, I, what's giving you that idea? Is it that just, is people getting in touch with you? It's people getting in touch with me, but also, you know, I was, I was volunteering as a lobbyist in Holly, I mean, in uh, DC for a while, actually, for the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, until I realized they were completely off the mark and I didn't want to be a lobbyist, but I was doing it to walk through the halls of power and to learn the ropes, and so I did. I've been preparing for this for a while. I, I do a lot of things behind the scenes, in secret, until it's time to strike. And, I mean, with American politics, it makes you think, well, you know, if you think about how conservative, small c conservative American politics is, in terms of the kinds of people it produces who lead, um, you know, is it really ready for um, a, uh, a, you know, a, a non-binary ex-Hollywood actress who brought down the system. Um, I don't know, are we ready for a know. reality show star that is a false billionaire and a compulsive liar? Sure. I think he's both, in, he's fascinating because he's both a compulsive truth teller and a compulsive liar. He tells the truth about the stuff he's not supposed to talk about, but then lies about everything else. It's quite fascinating. But it's interesting, I do have actually quite often a lot of support from the Trump base. And, and it's, I think they like people that stick it to Hollywood. They can't see kind of what's in their own backyard as a big glaring problem, but they can see, they can see the other, the faux liberalism always bothered me about Hollywood. And how would you explain being non-binary to the great American public? Well. What is it? I don't know. I don't really think I'm anything. I don't really identify as anything. You don't? No. I, I don't really care. It doesn't interest me. It's not where my interests lie. Doesn't a lot of small town America want traditional, traditional American values? You know, where does it fit I into don't. that? Who's to say I don't? Well, where does it fit in? I mean, or where, where is the? I've lived in a, a lot of small towns, and I and I and I 
I've talked to a lot of those people, and I think a lot of them are pretty amazing. They've just, they're so disenfranchised, and they're so disgusted. And then there's a lot that, you know, you'll be talking to somebody for a while, and they seem amazing, and all of a sudden they say something that you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, but I think, you know, if anything, maybe I won't win, but I can give people some food for thought. And would you try and get the Christian right out of Republican politics? Well, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Might as well. Might as well put it all on the docket. Might as well fight the biggest fight you can fight. But I'm not against them. I'm for them. I'm just for them being better. Can you do practical things as well within your life now to sort of see through the, the values you've been trying to talk about within, within acting or producing or directing or all those sorts of things as well? I mean, you know, if people want to live better lives... They do. Are you living a better life on a practical level with regard to your career, for example? I think so. You know. So would you tell artists to walk away from the Hollywood system then? So just don't engage with it? Yes. Do, 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 you, know, you don't have to anymore, do you? You don't have truth? to do. No, you don't. I, I think the Hollywood system is, is dying. I think it's... Um, I think beautiful films are beautiful, but I think it's fairly irrelevant. And I think it's a propaganda machine, and we need to dissect what it tells us. I got sent a script, you know, last year, shockingly, and um, my character had a laundry basket in every scene, but she never did laundry. I was curious why. There was no explanation. <laughs> it's that kind of stuff. Could you have ever just challenged it in the time, or would, you, would that have just been... It was even... Just you know, been walking away from a job? It would be walking away from a job. But it was also not the time yet to do so. So all those I people think who are trapped could. in it, I think that's now what I mean. You, could. you know, all those young people who are in that industry, who are going for auditions, who are being told to wear tight tops and take their clothes off or whatever it might be. I think that's changed. A lot. And I, I, I think you could, you know, now, before, um, you know, they have, um, according to the lead character or the secondary leads on a, what we call a call sheet that comes out every day to tell you, you know, who's working on the set and what they need on the set. I was always listed as number two, even though I was usually number one in the film. And it was always the man, even though if he was really my supporting actor in the movie, who always got number one. But I never went in and fought it because I would just be labeled a bitch and that would spread down the wire. And I was already fighting such a heavy blacklisting and someone coming at me all the time behind the scenes that I had to do everything I could to just be like very amiable and not go against the grain. So I guess I stored all that up and utilized it later. <laughs> I ask everybody in the in the podcast if they've got if they've got one sort of um, really hard to deliver, but sort of secret dream of sort of how to change the world. What what it would be? Do you have one? A secret dream, how to change the world. Yeah. I think if we could forget the indoctrination, I think if we can wave a, a wave a magic wand, and go back to before we were programmed and just to be set free, I think that would be a beautiful thing. Does it have to be fantasy life advice or can it be real? Is it real yeah. or fantasy? It can be either, whatever okay, you want. Okay, I'm gonna go fantasy on that one. <laughs> but it's interesting, that question, it certainly would have been something that would have very much applied a year and a half ago. But now the secret is out, the secret is out. Rose McGowan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us on Way to Change the World. Thank you so much.